Het onderzoeksrapport. Die invest. The research report of Kees van Rijn Wimstam into extreme violence by Dutch soldiers in South Sulawesi uh, disappeared immediately after its appearance in a deep drawer and remained uh, hidden for years as of today, together with the other revealing reports of the what's been called the Committee of Inquiry into the alleged extreme violence committed by Dutch troops in Indonesia. It is accessible to everyone. I should show it here, of course. Oh, here it is, Van Rij en Stam. Uh, it's a special uh, source publication delivered and introduced by Martin van der Bens. So how um, politicians and the government dealt with reports of extreme violence uh, has been the subject of investigation. So there's a joint publication, Languages of Violence, Silence, Information and Deception in the Indonesian War of Independence that will appear later this year. Uh, that was the work of Remco Raben and Peter Romein. And following the video about Van Rijn Stam, uh, Remco Raben and Peter Romein are interviewed by Hans Goedkoop about their sub-study. Remco Raben specializes in colonial and post-colonial history and is affiliated with the universities of Amsterdam and Utrecht. During the, the research, he was seconded to the NIOT. Peter Romein is head of the research department there and also professor of history of the 20th century at the University of Amsterdam. Ik ben Maarten van der Bent, ik ben onderzoeker bij het NIOT en ik heb voor dit project de rapporten van de commissie van Rijn en Stam bezorgd en ingeleid. Tot aan de tweede militaire offensief van december 1948 was er in het parlement en in de samenleving beperkt aandacht voor oorlogsmisdaden. Het geweld dat na het offensief losbarstte bracht een verandering in. In de Groen Amsterdammer werd bijvoorbeeld een brief gepubliceerd van een jonge militaire officier over oorlogsmisdaden die bij de bezetting van Jogjakarta waren voorgevallen. En in het parlement vroegen communisten en de linkervleugel van de Partij van de Arbeid aandacht voor de zaak. En dat leidde uiteindelijk in... Uh, oktober 1949 tot de uitzending van de commissie van onderzoek die de aard en de omvang van de gepleegde excessen zou gaan onderzoeken. De commissie bestond uit drie juristen, Kees Vrij, Wim Stam en Frederik Groenings van Zoelen. De commissie werd uitgezonden naar Indonesië, maar kreeg eigenlijk direct na aankomst te maken met de tegenslag. Oorspronkelijk waren er voor het onderzoek zes maanden uitgetrokken, maar bij aankomst bleek dat de soevereiniteitsoverdracht uh, gepland stond voor december 1949, waardoor er maar twee maanden voor onderzoek overbleven. Uh, in de tijd die nog resteerde besteedde de commissie vooral aandacht aan oorlogsmisdaden die na het offensief van december 48 waren voorgevallen, maar nam het ook kennis van eerdere excessen, zoals bijvoorbeeld de later berucht geworden eh, zogenaamde standrechtelijke executies van het depot speciale troepen onder leiding van kapitein Remo Westerling in Zuid-Sulawesi. Nou, terug in Nederland werd het al gauw stil rond de commissie, eh, want na de soevereiniteitsoverdracht werd eh, een onderzoek naar oorlogsmisdaden niet langer gezien als politiek opportun. Maar op aandringen van de minister van Justitie werkte de commissie wel verder aan een eh, onderzoek naar Westerling en de zuid sulawesi zaak. Nou, het rapport was vooral kritisch over de autoriteit en niet zozeer over de militairen die de actie hadden uitgevoerd. Eh, en dat is eigenlijk niet wat men van het rapport verwachtte. Uh, en in de ministerraad wordt dan ook besloten om niet tot vervolging over te gaan in de zuid sulawesi zaak en om het rapport ook niet met het parlement te delen. Nou, uiteindelijk komt het rapport uit de la. In januari 1969 vertelt Joop Hutting in de varen rubriek Achter het Nieuws over oorlogsmisdaden die door Nederlandse militairen, waaronder hij zelf in Indonesië, zijn gepleegd. En in die context raakt het bestaan van het, van het rapport alsnog in brede kring uh, bekend. Uh, Joop Den Uyl, de fractievoorzitter van de Partij van de Arbeid in de Tweede Kamer, vraagt om openbaarmaking van het rapport. En in het parool wordt in een pagina groot artikel het rapport samengevat. En daarop uh, nemen ambtenaren van het ministerie van Justitie contact op met Stam. En die vinden tot hun verbazing in het archief van de commissie dat al die tijd bij Stam in een kippenhok lag opgeslagen. Uh, uh, rapporten en originele stukken over andere zaken die door de commissie zijn onderzocht. En uh, dat legt dan de basis voor de excessen nota die later dat jaar verscheen. Onder de mat geschoten. Well, it's uh, good to have you here. Um, before the break, we talked about heavy uh, artillery, the intelligence services, justice, uh, judiciary, and their role in, in extreme violence. And then the follow-up question, what about the role of uh, government? You know, 
politicians, governments, and their responsibility for extreme violence in Indonesia. Gentlemen, Peter Romijn and Remco Raben. Be before the break with Esther Swinkels, we talked about the judiciary, and then the idea was, well, the civil authorities um, have to follow the military authorities. Was the same true for the government in Batavia and uh, The Hague? Well, maybe we shouldn't start in Batavia. Maybe we should start in the, the various regions. So w we talk about Batavia and The Hague, but w really we're talking about Indonesian history here. And that history uh, took place in various locations in Indonesia. They had Indonesian administrators and Dutch administrators. So that complicates things. But if we look at the Dutch governance, then we see that, just generally speaking, the uh, Dutch administrators fall in line with that whole story. You know, first we'll establish order, and then we can do actual governance. So everything else has to wait? Yes, so that's the, the primacy of the military agenda. So first control and then governance. Right, and that primacy starts with information, intelligence. We were discussing that prior to the break. Is the same true for the government? Yes. And that's true for the regional governments or the, the uh, governments in the theater of war and then to Batavia and then from Batavia to The Hague. There's this, this uh, official funnel from Batavia to The Hague and you see that in The Hague, Really, the storm story is set in a theater of war, then that's copied by Batavia and then also by the higher governments. And what do you lose along the way? Well, there's lots of moments where the story is uh, told again, and every moment the story is told again, you know, from the local commander to the troops commander, and then up to the uh, central command in Batavia, and then to the governor general, and then to the minister for colonies, and then, if all goes according to plan, to the council of ministers and parliament. Really, all those moments are uh, an opportunity to tell the story along the desired lines. So uh, all undesired elements disappear from the story, and then it is uh, a story of restoring order in everyone's best interest, you know, the interest of, of the Dutch authorities, the um, uh, Indonesians uh, of, of goodwill. And well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's not like a linear development in concealing things, you know, the euphemisms, the, the concealing takes place at quite a, a low level in that flow of information. So at the end, they hardly have to do anything. They hardly have to repress anything. That's right. And that knowledge exists high up in the uh, f that flow of information, but it's not activated for... Uh, political reasons, but the information really, when the report is made of military operations at the location itself, that information uh, is already reduced. That's a bureaucratic process. That's what happens in every war. But then they don't say, you know, how was the opponent eliminated exactly? So in that entire flow of information, it's further summarized, and, and reduced, and it, it, at no point does it become a problem. So that is how you get that uh, continuous concealment. Yes, and if you look what happens towards The Hague, then the, the war aspect disappears more and more, disappears from view. And what you see in all the various reports is that, you know, the opponent is unreliable, is cruel, cannot be trusted, and they provoke counteractions, but then those counteractions are not further specified in the report. So when you're a politician or an administrator in The Hague, all you read is that the, uh, the enemy is doing very unfortunate things, and then of course you have to take action against it. So it might even lead to relief. Oh, we're doing things. And I imagine with General Spohr, who's a fascinating man, he was very good at propaganda. You know, sometimes he came to The Hague, he would meet the press, he would receive a hero's welcome and, you know, preaching the gospel of our uh, good acts, our charity in Indonesia. Yes, if you read the minutes of uh, various meetings, and General Spohr is the man coming to tell the truth. 
Right, so the civil administration is being led by the military. And um, I grew up with the idea, because I'm part of a Knil family, you, you know, us uh, military were, were being guided by the administrators. They didn't send sufficient troops or material. That's what we simply had to work with. Can it both be true that there was powerlessness on both sides? Well, that takes us back to that first, the first thing we said, you know, the military agenda has primacy and all civil administrators recognize this. Famog and his successors realize that too. They depend, they're dependent on the military when it comes to their entire agenda. You cannot, in your own terms, on your own terms, decolonize things without first having achieved the military targets. Right, well... You, you, you give a reason for everybody uh, sticking to that line in the end, and you've used the term colonial dissociation. Can you explain that, please, Remco? Well, the colonial dissociation is a word that we come up with or that we've used to indicate that the standards that applied in the Netherlands did not apply in the colony were not deemed applicable in the colony, and that works in different ways. Dissociation means you, there's a certain distance between Indonesia and the Netherlands, geographically, but also when it comes to information, etc. The information flows. Uh, th there's a lot less information flowing that way, so it's literally at a distance. On the other hand, we also see a process where you know things that happen in Indonesia don't create too much of a fuss because apparently another standard is applied to what happens in Indonesia and what happens to Indonesians. Right, killing a Dutch person is not the same as killing an Indonesian person. That's right, an Indonesian dead person is worth less than a, a Dutch dead person. Right, because that's what they're used to, that's simply how they deal with each other there, that's what you have to do. Yeah, there's a whole conglomerate there of culturalistic and maybe even racist ideas behind all that, you know, about the the nature of Indonesians. Yes, you find this in all kinds of... Uh, uh, you find this at all kinds of level in The Hague. You know, uh, human life matters less to Asians. The only language they understand is the language of violence. That's the kind of language you see in political considerations. So th there's no ignoring that. Yeah, what I notice in orders to troops is that it very easily says, you know... Um, inflict max, maximum losses, but that's loss of human life. But please, the maximum loss of human life. Yeah, you see the word destroy a lot in those instructions. Right, so among all the euphemisms, that's a, a term they use on the ground there. Yes. But I'd just like to uh, talk more about that disassociation. You know, at a local level, you also see it. There's a lot of Indonesians who did raise this issue of violence. They went to their own administrators, they went to the village heads, or to the Gudanas, or to the regions. And those voices have never really been picked up by, for example, Dutch administrators, or by you know local military commanders. Because it was an Indonesian, so, pff, well. Exactly, yeah. They really had no access to justice or to the uh, information channels. So that was blocked. Yeah, it was always called Republican propaganda. So that does create the compression that in The Hague you could simply pretend the uh, unpleasantness did not exist. But at the same time, you had all those scandals that did get through to The Hague. What happened then? That's your department. Yeah, they got through... They became public, even, but you could say there were some procedural methods for dealing with that, which meant that, in the end, uh, they're not really investigated. I mean, it's only investigated if it, it's turning into a real scandal, then the Minister for Colonies goes to the Governor-General in, in Batavia and checks with them if they want to do an investigation and then it just disappears somewhere beyond the horizon. Six months later, it's returned and it it would have been made very small. Turns out it was a very different issue at all. It was Republican propaganda. So there's a whole range of methods for 
making these things uh, harmless. So that's why we've called our books the uh, language of violence. The um, way of talking, the words used is very important in order to make it clear that there wasn't a lot happening. And of course, there were a lot of whistleblowers also on the Dutch side, and they were also made harmless. Action was taken against them, though. Yes, there's an example of a soldier writing to the editorial board of a newspaper saying that they've experienced something very unpleasant, maybe something could be done, and then the matter is referred back for investigation, and... A fellow soldier is punished, but he's punished as well because he should have gone to his commander. He shouldn't have gone to the newspaper. And we know what would have happened if he told his commander from what Esther said. Right, so there's a story as well of, of three soldiers refusing to enter a kampong and destroy it, and oh, serious action was taken against them as well. So then the Dutch government knew very well how to punish people. Yes, they were brought before the, uh, they were court martialed. Yes, because what you don't want is for it to become public, for it to become a scandal. If, also, if you look at what happened in southern Sulawesi, it was known, maybe not in, in, in detail, but in general, certainly, we, we, it was known what the uh, armed forces were doing there, but it was explicitly said, oh, this shouldn't become public. So could you say that all that reporting... All the information going from the Indonesian reason, um, regions to The Hague is just one big cover-up, or is that saying is that going too far? You do use the word cover-up. Yes, but we've qualified it, because you can say cover-up, but that implies someone actually covering it up actively, that there's one person doing that. But really what we're saying is that it's a process where at various points in that process, it's in people's interest not to activate that information or to even conceal it. So a cover-up is not just one place. But you're also saying up to the highest levels in The Hague, there was an awareness of the violence being used in Indonesia. We didn't want to know. But, you know, not wanting to know indicates you know. That is the pattern. Yes, and if you did something about it, then you couldn't win the war. And... One of the things that really surprised us is that idea that the Netherlands had until the last moment, which was that they had to determine the future of Indonesia and that uh, those military actions were the instrument to bring that about. Right, this is another example of how that violence was present in all parts of Dutch government and administration, or at least how it was known about up to the highest levels. So all the conclusions so far are in line with that. And then I was just wondering, you know, with all the investigations, all that research done, and that all leads to the same results, you know, we're talking about a colonial bias here. Could it be that you as researchers, you know, working together for four years, you, you also grew this joint bias, meaning everything is coming together now? Well, I don't know whether it's really coming together now. Um, and, of course, this is a problem we discussed amongst ourselves, and we all have our own biases. Mine is that I joined the NEOD in the time that Lu de Jong um, had his issues with the Indonesian veterans. So I've been fascinated ever since uh, by that discussion about Dutch military actions. And over recent years, I've noticed that there were much broader perspectives that were possible. So in my case, it's certainly true. Yeah, two things I'd like to say. First of all, of course, we worked together very well. We also had some very fierce debates. So it's not that we all uh, felt the same about everything, but you grew closer together. Yes, in general, we were talking about the same things, of course. And secondly, I mean, of course, we have our biases. I am a Dutch man, and we um, mostly focused on the Dutch perspectives, not exclusively. Uh, they've not been mentioned so much today, but of course, I've had a certain perspective. But it doesn't mean that the things that we've established, that we found, that that is all discursive and that it's only an opinion, but you'll understand that some people um, might have 
questions about this, might have doubts about this. You know, now they're all agreeing on something that 10 years ago nobody would have written down. Is that because of the sources or is it in our in your heads? Yet 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, these things were being written down. But, you know, all of us got talking. But even the sources publication of Van der Rohe about the Dutch-Indonesian conflict which was mentioned, even based on that, you could write a book arriving at pretty much these conclusions. I mean, we've added further detail, but I don't think that this was an artificial process, you know, which, which brought us all to the same thought pattern. Exactly what I expected you to say. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Ik ga weer verder. Hoe keken de Verenigde Staten? Right. How did the US, the UK and France view the Indonesian War of Independence? And in what ways were those countries trying to influence the parties? And where did the Dutch get their military equipment from? These questions were central to the research project carried out by Tom van den Bergen, research at KITLV, and NEOD researchers Jeroen Kemperman and Emma Kaiser. The three of them also wrote the collection Diplomacy and Violence, the International Context of the Indonesian War of Independence, which also is published today. Hans Goedkoop will talk to two of the authors who could be here today, Emma Kaiser and Jeroen Kemperman, and they will talk about the international views on the War of Independence. Right, Jeroen and Emma, great to have you here. How did Western allies perceive those actions. It's an ominous sign, isn't it, that the Netherlands tried to keep the conflict as small as possible. It was internal. Nobody else had to sort of provide a, a view on it, whereas the Indonesian side continuously worked on informing the entire world and involving the rest of the international community. What does that difference say already about the belief in being right? on both sides. Well, I think you've said it already. Um, Dutch, the Netherlands, was convinced of, you know, that the fact that they were in the right and they want to, of course, explain thing, things in the most favorable way. Yes, that's one way to explain it. But on the other hand, you could also say, if you want to keep out everybody, you could also uh, know that this is uh, not something that people won't ask questions about. Yes, but saying that it was a predominantly Dutch-Indonesian conflict and that the Dutch were just uh, acting in its sovereignty, but that could only be a justification of what the Netherlands was doing. So it would be very dangerous to admit in The Hague that it had an international dimension because in theory it could evoke uh, international uh, action. Well, and the fear, of course, that the actions by the Indonesians was maybe more justified than what the Dutch were doing. Well, uh, the world uh, shared more of the Indonesian vision of it being a conflict. It was not something that was only concerned, uh, that, that concerned the Dutch and Indonesians, it concerned the rest of the world. So in 1947, indeed, Indonesia can uh, participate in the uh, Security Council, right? Yes. Is this a de facto recognition of Indonesia? You could argue that, yes, but most countries have never said it that concretely. And I think behind the scenes, it was also not in the interest of the international community in general terms to really choose one side to be very pro-Republic or pro-Dutch, because what they wanted was to come to a solution as soon as possible, and parties had to be brought together for that. So, you know, it was a little bit of nudging and pushing and not really choosing sides. I, I, really, want, I, I really believe that everyone wanted a political solution. Uh, so the United States became more and more anti-Dutch. They are threatening to uh, discontinue the uh, Marshall 
aid and also no longer supporting them on a military level. So it seems that there is a change. What you were looking for was the continuity in how these countries approached it. So you predominantly talk about the US, UK and France. And then the question is really about what do they want? Especially the US and the UK, their primary uh, goal was a solution to the conflict because battle uh, was not good for the countries, the world, and not for the US and the UK. The world wanted the Indonesian products. So, so you say it's about the economy that had to get started, uh, especially the Indonesian products that, that were so loved and needed by the people in the US and the UK. And the longer the conflict took, of course, and the longer the ports were closed and blockaded, this was very problematic. So everybody had his own interest to get the conflict to end. So it is, in the end, about the interests of these great powers and not so much about friendship between nations. Basically, countries don't have friends. They only have other interests, right? That's the idea. And that, obviously, is the frustration of the Netherlands. You know, they thought they had that loyalty and that they had earned that uh, by, you know, allying with them during World War II. And that, in therefore, in the Indonesian conflict, they would be supported by the US and UK. And that, of course, caused some frustration. Isn't it fascinating, though, the Netherlands was not a newcomer in the international community, but there's something really naive about trusting on the fact that, you know, we belong together and we agree. Well, maybe the language of diplomacy maybe played a role because that is, those words are chosen very carefully. And if the Dutch were so convinced by being right, then this can come across. Okay, you uh, researched supply of weapons by the US and UK, what developments have you found? You do see the continuity in that, in that policy. So the US all had already said that they were going to put in place an embargo on uh, weapons, etc. And UK came later, but you did see that something was possible when it came to supply of weapons, because it was very difficult to uh, uh, of course, uh, not to help out the Netherlands, because in the light of the Cold War, that would have been a bad move. So basically, things could be bargained, all on the basis of interests rather than on friendship. Right. Then you do find a, a connection between France and the Netherlands, because France had Indochina, which is... Uh, so. Did you find that those countries had each other's backs? Well, you'd expect that France was uh, involved in similar conflicts in their uh, areas, and that, of course, so of course, Indonesians and Vietnamese would find support with each other, which dot, did not really happen because the Indonesian point of view, the idea was that it could be problematic to have a very strong connection to the communist Chinese and that that would sort of uh, make the relationship with the US, for example, very difficult. And then it would indeed be obvious that France and the Netherlands, in that sense, you know, would sort of move closer to each other. And for the Netherlands, France had one big advantage. You know, they had a seat in the Security Council and they had a veto right. So they basically could uh, obstruct anything there. So France, to a certain extent, did try to sort of uh, cover for the Netherlands because it was, of course, something they did not want to end up in a position that they didn't want to be, you know, like the Netherlands, you're next. But... Um, of course, France had to relate to a social context as well. They couldn't pretend to be uh, an anti-Indonesian power all the time. They had to take into account the emerging nations uh, like China and India. And that would also influence the French position, you know, if they would choose that, the Dutch side. This is a fascinating detail when it comes to the view on the great powers, the Western powers on the Netherlands. Whatever they did, extreme violence... No, not so much. That was not the problem, according to them. How is that possible? Well, that was a strategic choice, predominantly, because the end goal of the international community was 
to get to a political agreement between the fighting parties. And then, of course, it doesn't help to focus on violent or acts of violence from both sides, because that would only sort of drive them apart instead of bringing them together. Do you think that colonial dissociation was also relevant because it's all, all Western powers that uh, didn't really care whether, you know, casualties, uh, well, of course, they would never have uh, said that themselves in those words, but especially the Brits and the Americans did realize that if you operate uh, on an international level, you know, you uh, sometimes get your hands dirty. So I think in London and Washington, they did understand the perspective and they had a fear of it backfiring if they were to condemn or in any way say something about that extreme violence and that it could lead to accusations towards their own actions. Jeroen and Emma, thank you very much. The war in Indonesia and the violence that Dutch troops used in this process was for a long time not a subject that was much discussed and written about in the Netherlands. For the project about the aftermath of the war, Meinert van der Kaij investigated which factors contributed to this. His research is recorded in the book An Evil Conscience, The Struggle with the Indonesian War of Independence from 1950. In the following video, Meinder tells more about the Dutch struggle with the war in Indonesia and the way in which that war only got a place in the Dutch culture of remembrance at a very late stage and in phases. Ik ben en ik ben onderzoeker bij het KITLV in Leiden. De politiek ging na 1950 extreem moeilijk om met de geschiedenis in Indonesië. Verschillende kabinetten Drees probeerden die via een nachtmerrie onmiddellijk te vergeten en achter zich te laten. Een goed voorbeeld daarvan is dat zij het rapport van Rijs Tam onmiddellijk in het archief dumpten en daar niet meer naar probeerden om te kijken. Een ander voorbeeld is een enquête, parlementaire enquête die aanvankelijk daarna zou worden gehouden, uh, niet doorging. En de, er waren enkele historici die onderzoek wilden doen naar die periode, maar die uh, kregen nul op het gekest. Uh, de archieven bleven gesloten. En Drees zei daarover, die geschiedenis moet ooit eens geschreven worden, maar niet nu. De journalisten die in Indonesië hadden gewerkt tijdens de oorlog, voelden na 1950 geen enkele aandrang om over dat onderwerp te schrijven. Dat vonden ze veel te pijnlijk. En ook militairen die na 1950 journalist zouden worden, schreven daar verder nooit over. En dat verandert pas eind jaren 60. Ik heb daar uh, meegedaan aan oorlogsmisdaden. Ik heb ze zien verrichten dat er kampongs doorzeefd werden... Uh, waarvan de militaire noodzakelijkheid niemand destijds inzag. Dat er verhoren plaatsvonden waarbij uh, op een afschuwelijke manier gemarteld werd. Dat er... Uh, wraakacties gehouden werden, uh, waarvan even, even minder militaire noodzaak uh, in te zien was. Er stond een enorme commotie naar aanleiding van de, de Huting-uitzending. En regering de Jong zag zich gedwongen tot het uh, laten uitvoeren van een kort archiefonderzoek. Dat resulteerde in excessenota. En minister-president de Jong trok daaruit de conclusie... dat er slechts sprake waren geweest van wat excessen... En dat het leger als geheel weinig blaam trof. Minister-president de Jong slaagde erin om te voorkomen dat er strafrechtelijk onderzoek zou volgen naar het extreem geweld. Dat er een parlementaire enquête zou worden gehouden. Dat um, er historisch onderzoek zou worden gedaan naar het geweld. En in plaats daarvan plaatste hij een bronnenonderzoek naar het diplomatiek verkeer tijdens die oorlog. En hij zorgde ervoor dat de oorlogsmisdrijven gepleegd door Nederlandse militairen in Indonesië zouden verjaren in tegenstelling tot die oorlogsmisdrijven gepleegd door Japanse en Duitse militairen. Na 1960 wordt het relatief stil. En met relatief bedoel ik dat er wel onthullende onderzoeken kwamen 
naar uh, het geweld in Indonesië. Ik zal denken aan, uh, aan het onderzoek van Van Doorn en Hendricks, ontsporing van geweld. En het onderzoek van Willem Reizerreef, uh, de affaire zuid Celebes. Maar die studies veroorzaakten geen enkele ophef. Die gingen rimpeloos voorbij. Dat veranderde in uh, 1987. Als Lou de Jong in uh, een van zijn boeken over de Tweede Wereldoorlog... harde noten kraakt over het gedrag van Nederlandse militairen in Indonesië. Uh, de veteranen zijn daar verschrikkelijk boos over. En uh, de, 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 de zee ging zo hoog dat de Jong zich gedwongen zag... om cruciale frases uit zijn onderzoek aan te passen. Na Lou de Jong slaagt de veteranen er bij het brede publiek erin om uh, sympathie te wekken voor hun benarde situatie. Uh, zij worstelden nog ontzettend met trauma's die zij hadden opgelopen tijdens uh, die oorlog. Het bleek dat zij veel vaker in de WO terechtkwamen dan hun leeftijdsgenoten... die destijds in Nederland waren gebleven. En zij slaagden er kortom in om het beeld van slachtoffer neer te zetten. En, het, en de politiek bleek daar enorm vatbaar voor. Tegelijkertijd kwam in het linkerdeel van het politieke spectrum de behoefte op om excuses aan te bieden voor het extreme geweld. En ook om de geboortedatum van 17 augustus 1945 te accepteren. Die beweging leidt ertoe dat de regering ingaat op herhaald verzoek van president Suharto om Beatrix de viering van de 50-jarige jubileum van de revolutie in Jakarta mee te vieren. Plannen daarvoor zijn in vergaand stadium... als uiteindelijk de veteranen erin slagen om Lubbers eh, te laten inzien... dat heel veel mensen daardoor gekwetst zouden worden. En alle plannen werden afgeblazen. Beatrix ging een week later. Het werd een beroerd staatsbezoek. 1995 werd toch een kanteljaar en dat had alles te maken met een reportage dat RTL 5 uitzond over een dorpje Rabagede waar Nederlandse militairen in 1947 een bloedbad hadden aangericht waar honderden mensen bij waren omgekomen. Voor het eerst werd het Nederlandse publiek geconfronteerd met het verdriet van nabestaanden van die actie. En zagen ze mensen van vlees en bloed die slachtoffer waren geworden. Deze langzaam groeiende aandacht voor de oorlog in Indonesië... leidt er uiteindelijk toe dat in 2005 de minister van Buitenlandse Zaken Ben Pot... naar Jakarta afreist om daar namens de Nederlandse regering te verklaren... dat 17 augustus 1945 als geboortedatum feitelijk wordt geaccepteerd. Daarnaast deed hij de beroemde uitspraak dat Nederland tijdens die oorlog aan de verkeerde kant van de geschiedenis heeft gestaan. De volgende grote doorbraak was in 2011, met de rechterlijke uitspraak in de zaak... die was aangespannen door nabestaanden van de slachtoffers van Rabagede. De rechter vondste het Nederlandse overheid tot het maken van excuses voor het bloedbad... en het toekennen van schadevergoedingen aan de nabestaanden. Op zoek naar een onafhankelijkheidsstrijder werden in Rawagade 431 mannen zonder enige vorm van proces geëxecuteerd. De nabestaanden vechten al jaren om erkenning en om een schadevergoeding. Volgens de Nederlandse staat zijn ze veel te laat, maar daar is de rechter het dus niet mee eens. De impact van de rechterlijke uitspraak naar Rawagade is dat definitief niet meer valt te ontkennen dat Nederlandse militairen extreem geweld hebben gebruikt in Indonesië. En dat thema verdwijnt niet meer in het publieke debat. Het komt tot uiting in de journalistiek, maar het komt ook terug in speelfilms, in de literatuur. En ook de politiek raakt daar steeds meer van doordrongen. En dat blijkt onder meer uit het financieren van een zeer groot onderzoek naar het geweld in Indonesië. En dat leidt er onder meer ook toe dat koning Willem-Alexander in 2020 excuses aanbiedt voor het extreme geweld. In het voorjaar van 
In the spring of 2019, a team of 12 domestic and foreign researchers came together at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study, the NIAS, for a comparative study of the colonization wars. The starting point of this project was that such an international comparison can offer more insight into the causes and the nature of the violence used in the war in Indonesia. The first results of this project, led by uh, Thijs Brokades Zadelberg and Bart Lüttighuis, were published in July 2020 in a Dutch language theme issue of the magazine BMGN. A more extensive English language collection will follow this summer at Cornell University Press under the title Empire's Violent End. At the launch of the BMGN theme issue, a filmed interview with the two project leader was published, which we show here. Afterwards, Hans Goedkoop will talk to them about the added value of the international comparative research. Thijs Brokades Zaalberg is affiliated with the Netherlands Defence Academy and Leiden University. Bart Lettighuis worked for KIT LV and Leiden University during the research. Since this academic year, he has been a primary school teacher. Hans, go ahead. No, of course not. We will first watch the video. We staan voor het Nationaal Militair Museum in Soesterberg. Hier toont Nederlandse militaire verleden. Een aspect van dat Nederlandse militaire verleden was de decolonisatieoorlog die we gevoerd hebben in Indonesië na de Tweede Wereldoorlog. Ik praat vandaag met. Today I'll be talking to Bart Luttinghuis en Thijs Brokade Zaalberg about a forum which they uh, produced at the request of the board of the B. BMGM, and I'll ask them about the uh, use of sources and comparative studies. Bart and Thijs, for the BMGM forum, you've opted for a comparative perspective. Why is that? Well, first of all, because we want to understand Dutch violence better. What we've seen so far is that the comparison has been made, but often in order to be able to downplay it. It is interesting to see that both military leaders at the time and scientists later, researchers later, uh, showed that tendency. So at the time it was often said, well, yes, but the British in Malaysia, they're also being very harsh, or the French are even worse. You know, sci researchers later also had that same impression, and Ludo Jung in the 80s drew some harsh conclusions about Dutch violence, but it also he showed that reflex too, saying the other was worse. You know, French, Portuguese, the Americans Vietnam, they were even more violent. And that's exactly what we wanted to avoid. That's not what our comparison is about. We want to compare in order to understand better. And you see that all in all those wars, things go wrong. Uh, extreme violence is used. And by making comparisons, you can look for these structural causes. You know, what is the common denominator between all those conflicts? What's gone wrong in Kenya, in Malaysia, in Algeria? And how can it help us understand what went wrong in the Dutch East Indies? All right. Uh, but it's difficult to compare cases. How did you go about that? By bringing foreign experts to the Netherlands and then linking them up with a Dutch researcher and then having a new comparison on, on a certain detail. Prime Lim, for example, we brought from the US in order to work with the Zaire Hamani and to look into technical violence, which was the Dutch term for the use of heavy weaponry like this bomber here of the uh, uh, Kniel military and also artillery. The Dutch historians have assumed that the most civilian ca casualties were caused by the use of this kind of weaponry. So then put that Dutch case into the context of other conflicts from the same period, then you will discover that there are you know, doubts you can have about that conclusion. These researchers tend to say that direct violence committed by the infantry, by troops on the ground, um, led to most casualties. And another theme that was researched by Steph Goliola and Natalia Vinch, that's about sexual violence, rape. That is a theme or a subject uh, which figures prominently in the histories of the Algerian independence war, but for Indonesia, uh, no one's really written about that. So Steph and Natalia uh, did a deep dive there, looked at the archives, and then discovered that when you want to investigate that for Indonesia, there's lots of material in the archives. So by making a comparison, you can discover blind spots in your own history. 
Right, but what is your general conclusion based on all those comparisons? Well, our general questions were about the causes of extreme violence. Why did things go so badly wrong in Indonesia and in those other wars as well? And you can give a lot of causes, and many historians have done so, but from our comparison, what we've learned, one of our main conclusions is that uh, a common denominator for all those wars and for all those causes that were found earlier is impunity. In those wars for troops, it was possible to use excessive violence without being punished, and that was a system uh, that was maintained by those responsible. So the final responsibility for this violence was with those who were, you know, in charge politically or militarily speaking, but they never were held to account. And uh, there you are, live with us. In that video, uh, there was, at the end, a conclusion that you shared with us almost in passing. So it took a while uh, for it to land with me, because it's quite the conclusion. Impunity as a system. You know, those politically and militarily responsible maintained that system deliberately so, without ever being held to account. Is that, just very briefly, is, is that what the Dutch did in Indonesia? Well, yes, very briefly. And, and that's why the comparative studies were so relevant. That's a line you clearly see something shared between the various cases, because the same mechanism you can also see in, for example, with, for example, the British and what they did. If you look at the Dutch case, and of course we have the examples of General Spohr, who says, well, it's simply not opportune to uh, convict the commander in the case of Ravagade, but also in the British case, and that was mostly about Kenya, you know, a war which in British history for a long time was forgotten, there the commander did something similar with regards to the Kenyan uh, auxiliary troops who tortured on a, on a large scale, and at a certain point they beat eight uh, Kenyan detainees to death, and he clearly said, let's not act, let's not do anything, this is not opportune, we need this local help, so we cannot punish them. And really, he was more honest about it than General Spohr was, because at least internally he clearly said, we're not going to do it because I have good reasons for this, but Spohr really says that this, this shouldn't happen, but then does nothing. All right, well, you drew comparisons with uh, Great Britain, France, and the Netherlands, and I don't really know whether it is a relief that the others were pretty much as bad. Well, as we were saying in the video, that, that wasn't the goal. That was exactly not the goal of our comparison. But what was the goal then? Well, the problem was that the times when comparisons were made, uh, when it was done in opinion pieces, then usually the idea behind it was to say, well, okay, things happened, it wasn't great, but just look at what the French did in Algeria. And those kinds of degrees of guilt don't help anyone. We, we really we wanted to look at how violence occurs, not just in Indonesia, but also in Algeria, in Kenya, in Malaysia, and in Vietnam. By looking at all those things, you are better able to analyze what the answer is to the why question. You know, why does it happen? I mean, there's like 20 causes you can give, and they all at various stages contributed to the occurrence of extreme violence, but what is the common denominator between those things? And there you have that aspect of the impunity. That is uh, something that connects the various causes uh, in all those countries. So knowing that, of the Netherlands, of other powers as well, what are we going to do with that knowledge? You say it's not about attributing blame, we're not going to be starting any tribunals. What are we going to do? As historians, as society, as armed forces, whatever you like. Just start with you as a historian. Well, what it's made me realize, and this might... I'm asking this because lots of people might be thinking, oh, now we're, we're blamed again. What use is that? But this knowledge, what purpose does it serve? That's the question, really. Well, what it's taught me 
is that I've become even more aware that these wars in that context against the independence movements could not be won without these extreme means and that politicians, in order to obtain their goals, deliberately put the military in that situation, put troops in that situation and sent them on an impossible mission, really. For the British, that was less so because they often had smaller conflicts with just one ethnic group. They had some control over the course of the conflict, very gradually. They were able to use less violence to be more selective, but it took uh, them a while to reach that point. Well, I have a very moralistic thought that I'd like to share with you at the end of this. So let's say you look at this more closely and, and look more closely at where things go wrong. Could the use of that be that parliaments and other regulatory bodies uh, will be able to see in time, oh, we need to take action now, something is going wrong here. Is that possible or should we simply accept that this is how it goes? Well, of course, as a historian, I'm always cautious to draw these kinds of conclusions. Well, that's why I'm asking. Yes, and it's a very good question, but if you look at how these wars were waged in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and then look at how wars are waged these days, you know, um, major strides have been taken, and unfortunately, and that's mostly to do with responsibility at the highest level, preparations, you know, punishment in case things go wrong, and in Afghanistan and in Iraq, of course, there were scandals, but that they were on a much different scale than those, uh, you know, in India, Malaysia, Algeria, and everything that came out much later there. So I think that should be a lesson to politicians uh, and to the army that you can do things to prevent this. And so, sorry, after all that unpleasantness, we have to stop, but uh, that progress has been made. That was a good note to end it on. Thank you. Right. I would love to keep talking with the uh, three other researchers, but uh, I can't. Well, no, because the, oh, the the leaders will get their turn later and the press can ask questions. I'm sure you can ask questions then as well, Hans. But now it is time for some questions from the audience. So we're getting a lot of questions, I've been told. A lot of those questions that are similar have been co combined, so we're trying to answer as many as we can here. And again, I'd like to emphasize that all questions will be answered with all due care after today in writing. So Hans, you, you have your pile of papers. Yes, I'm now reading it for the first time. Question for Thais, good to have you back here. Um, so there's mention of excessive violence, various terms that have been used. But anyway, excessive violence, doesn't that come within the uh, military doc doctrine that was prevalent at the time? No. When we're talking about, and this is what we've been mostly talking about, when we talk about torture, execution of prisoners, without any military need, uh, you know, shooting up campongs, other violence without military necessity, then no, it doesn't come with, within the um, military laws of the time. So that's something that struck us. A lot of the things we're talking about today didn't necessarily take place during combat operations, but it happened outside of those, you know, in prisons, in camps, in the aftermath of a, of a battle, maybe in the margins. But there's less, uh, there's not so much a direct link with uh, immediate combat. And there's a strong awareness, you know, we're doing this, but really we shouldn't. Yes, that, that stands out in ego documents and diaries as well, especially original diaries of those days. We have more and more of those, fortunately. And there you can clearly see that, you know, the person writing things down at that point is very critical of their own organization. And there's many examples of a very a harsh assessment, uh, certainly of torture and execution of prisoners. And did the researchers have sufficient military knowledge? Yes, I'm glad to answer that question. Of course, uh, a lot of the researchers that were part of the program are military historians, uh, also connected to the NIMH. I worked there for 10 years as well before I uh, started working for the Dutch Defense Academy. And 
before I investigated various military missions. That's just, just about me. But that, yeah, there was significant military knowledge in the research group as a whole. And that is the the use of those various institutions working together. I've learned a lot from uh, colleagues from various institutes, and I think they learned from me as well. It's mostly the first and second generation um, that are slightly cautious, you know, all these young people who've never even served in the military and they're telling us what war is. Well, I was a reservist, a slightly more distant past, so I hope that helps uh, me. And I went to Afghanistan twice, that might have helped. There's more questions for you, but there's others, uh, for questions for others as well, so thank you. Peter Romijn. So, the results of the research, does that mean that this war was illegal and therefore the United States of Indonesia? Well, this is complicated because there's two levels. Well, the Netherlands considered, until the transfer of sovereignty, uh, considered it uh, an internal conflict that had to be solved. And Indonesia declared independence on the 17th of August 1945. Uh, an independent state as part of the revolution. And a revolutionary state can uh, create itself. Uh, negotiation processes took place in the midst of all these struggles. This led to a roundtable conference in which uh, the United States of Indonesia was formed, uh, amongst which the Republic of Indonesia. That's a long story. So, And at the transfer of sovereignty, nobody... Uh, seemed happy and was happy, but there was a union that was created under the authority of Queen Juliana, Netherlands and the, in Indonesia uh, as partners, and a couple of years later this was over because nobody was happy with that and it was not sustainable. So saying that it was illegal from international law has, is basically irrelevant. Another question to you. Why say Indonesia and not East Indies. Because Indonesia was a reality. And sure, I talk about Batavia, uh, but I mean the administrative center of the attempt to uh, restore Dutch East India. Uh, but Indonesia was much more of a reality. But isn't there a moment in the war that, on the Dutch side, they officially transferred to the name Indonesia, right? Correct. That was somewhere around 1948. And then the entire language changes, but Indonesia is still, let's say, ours. The fact that we talk about Indonesia a lot might suggest that the country was belonged to Indonesia and was Indonesia and not Hours. Well, obviously, if you uh, do your research in history, you have to be exact. And if you talk to the Republic Indonesia, then you refer to that. If you refer to territory, then it was Dutch, and then it was called Indonesia. Um, basically, you know, the best thing would be, according to some people, to refer to the archipelago. So one more, Remco Raben, for you. The study into violence is a result of political considerations. So all these motivations and considerations were researched back then. So what should the response from The Hague, from government, be today? Right. So, so you're, pretend you're a politician. What should the response be from the government? to this series of studies. Well, we are historians, not uh, ethical experts, and but history is not an exact science. So that's just, you know, to buy myself some time to think about this. <laughs> and what I believe maybe does not matter that much, but what this entire uh, project has been is accountability. We give accountability as to what happened and why it happened and why that tolerance for all that violence. And no matter what gesture you're going to make, I believe that uh, the government and politicians today should be open to the knowledge that we've produced 
and that they should be the first to realize that they need to acknowledge and face up to uh, the complexity and the many, many violence dimensions to this conflict. That still for large parts of the country have been off the table for a long time. Well, they were always within reach, if you will. We know it, but we look the other way, right? Well, that brings me back to that colonial dissociation principle, because um, that confrontation with Indonesia had never been active, so it could always be off the table. You could always tuck it away. And then there was always a journalist or a historian who said, this is a forgotten war, this is the forgotten violence, and this is exactly the effect of the two countries that are so far away from each other and that and basically marginalized that history of violence no longer, so a little bit less. Thank you. Yes, that brings us to our second break. We will resume exactly at 12 o'clock by presenting the conclusion, Gert Oost-India of KLTV, Bert Schoenmaker of NIMH and Frank van Vrij of Nieuwot. So this part of the program is broadcast live, but you can also switch to one of the online channel of the NOS, Public Broadcaster. Thank you, Hans Goedkoop, for your very, very pleasant way of interviewing uh, and struggled your way through many, many, many studies and took us by the hand. Thank you for being here. For those of you who have been watching, I hope you'll forgive us that the first part of the presentation after the break will sound familiar to you. That is inevitable because many people will only be joining the program as of 12 o'clock. And today, but also after today, you can email your questions to our researchers through that same email address, info at ind45-50.nl. And you see it on the screen. Should you feel the need to talk to someone, you can phone to Stichting Pelita or the Veterans Desk of the Dutch Veterans Institute, so you see the numbers on screen. I would like to thank you for your attention for now, and I would like to see you after the break at exactly 12 o'clock.